and it's now a great pleasure for me to introduce Chad Gaffield, the president of the uh, Conseil de Recherche en Sciences Humaines. We're very fortunate to have Chad as a leading spokesman for our discipline and its role, disciplines and their role in society. Uh, as everyone in this room, I'm sure, believes uh, his vision and understanding of the need to embrace change has been critical to articulating the value of our work and, and ensuring its credibility uh, with decision makers uh, uh, in government and in other sectors uh, of our society. Uh, on notre, on notre personnel, uh, depuis le début de mon mandat, j'ai beaucoup profité non seulement de, uh, de ses conseils et son exemple, mais aussi de, de son amitié. Merci, Chad. La parole est à toi. <clears throat> Merci beaucoup à tous et toutes. Could we just stop, though? We didn't get a chance to really applaud that. That was just terrific. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Alors bonjour à tous et toutes et grand merci euh, d'être venu ici en si grand nombre ce matin. Euh, Peut-être certains de vous euh, se rappellent, euh, en fait, il y a plus que six ans maintenant, presque sept ans, euh, un de mes premiers discours que j'ai fait après j'ai été nommé président était ici, en fait, à, à l'Assemblée générale, euh, in the <coughs> fall of 2006. Uh, it was, and it's great to, to see some of you uh, uh, who were there at that time. <clears throat> I must say also it's great to see some new faces. And I remember some years ago when I began mentioning that, you know, 60% uh, of all profs on campus now have been hired since the year 2000. People said, that can't be right. I remember I had an argument with a good friend of mine, a demographer, a well-known demographer. He said, Chad, you know, uh, Stop saying that. It's not true. And uh, I said, gee, was wow. And then uh, we went back and forth. It took a while, actually. He was, um, he didn't want to believe me. But anyway, uh, we got there, and he wrote, but he actually apologized. It was kind of nice. He said, you know what? I didn't notice that. Uh, and in fact, it's true. So it's great to see some new faces. Moi, je suis ici ce matin avec mes collègues, Giselle Yasmin, uh, Brenda Copley, et d'autres. Je vois, j'ai vu Cindy McIntyre. Est-ce que Thérèse est ici? En tout cas, uh, I'm just so pleased uh, to, to see you all uh, this morning. And uh, I want to start by um, just saying, you know, um, seven years now, I'm toujours vivant. And I, it's really en grand partie grâce à vous. And I want to emphasize the, how uh, energizing it is for me to come and have a chance to chat with you and, and to collaborate with you so closely. Yesterday I had a chance to uh, spend a bit of time with Noreen Golfman, uh, and uh, wow, just, just great memories. Uh, comme contribution ce matin, uh, ce que je vous propose, et évidemment on va parler d'une initiative que nous avons lancée, uh, en fait, il y a quelques années maintenant. Gisèle est la, la grande spécialiste de ça, et si je me trompe, elle va sans doute uh, m'aider. Mais je veux aussi situer ça. And I want to pick up on uh, many of the themes that, that Graham uh, mentioned, I think, which are, are, are so important. Uh, but we also want to give lots of time for questions. Alors, uh, on, on va y aller très rapidement. Bouclez vos ceintures de sécurité. Mais je veux partager uh, avec vous un petit peu uh, où nous sommes, l'orientation uh, que nous avons pris et un peu le bilan perspective. Uh, quand on pense à, 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 aux années qui s'en viennent. Uh, and like Graham, you know, in my job, uh, there's lots of reasons to be pessimistic sometimes. Um, and, and it's in an international phenomena. Uh, this week, you may have been noticing in the United States, uh, this, uh, passing a resolution, um, uh, so basically uh, making it exceedingly difficult for uh, National Science Foundation and their uh, behavioral uh, economics division to finance political science. Uh, astonishing. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we can be pessimistic, but I want to share with you 
uh, um, some reasons for optimism and, and a, a real sense of that. And often I take as, as kind of a, a point of departure, I think about Northrop Fry's great volume, The Educated Imagination. Uh, and he, he says in there something that I think is, is really important from his Massey lectures. The fundamental job of the imagination or ordinary life is to produce out of the society we have to live in a vision of the society we want to live in. Uh, and, and I think that's really a driving force and something that I try to keep in mind all the time. And one way we think about that is to really focus on what we can control. Uh, and that's how we've been thinking about that at Shirk. Our enduring ambitions that we launched in, in uh, 2006 was a notion, in fact, that uh, when we think about Shirk and, and our contribution we can make, quality has to really be at the forefront of that. Uh, we have to accept the fact that we are the most selective of all granting agencies, uh, and, and we, our focus is, is really in making sure that promotion of excellence is, is done as well as possible. The other aspect of that is just us as an organization. How you run something, an organization, is a topic in the social science and humanities. Can we exemplify that? Can we, can we really embrace that challenge and say, why can't Shirk be the best in the world at what it does? Uh, and, and we've been on that path. We're nowhere near, but you know what? Uh, I, I think we, we see that as an ambition. Connections. To embrace the notion, in fact, that in the 21st century, uh, you really have to be connected to really play your role. And I think about our era now as a T-shaped era. Yes, we need a specificity, but we need to contextualize that. We think about that in terms of across campus. We think about that campus community. We think about that Canada and the world. And we're also thinking about that in terms of how we work. We work in parts of networks. We con contribute. We see ourselves in that context. We try to be as connected as possible. And in terms of impact. We've embraced the challenge of talking about and, 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 and really trying to share the value of what we do and why we do it. And we also are very conscious internally of the impact of our work on others. And, and, and you can see that in terms of thinking about that in all kinds of, of different ways. So we've embraced that ambition and really to rethink it. Un point de départ qui était, nous, uh, très important, l'idée de définir qu'est-ce que c'est les sciences humaines. What are the social science humanities? And I think we boiled it down, and, and, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way of thinking about it. What do we do? We focus on people. We think about human expression, human thought, behavior in the past and present, and we always keep in mind how we might help make a better future. And that's a value proposition that I think explains why we can be optimistic. And again, we're going to come back to this, but my sense is the conviction that this century is going to be known as the century when humans really took seriously and did better in terms of understanding people. So, on a commencé avec ça, in terms of our organization, can we develop a governance system that really reflects the best we know, the best research about governance? We changed our whole council. We brought in leaders from across campus, across the public, private, uh, nonprofit sectors. We developed grids of competencies. We had all kinds of work to really try to get us in a place where we felt com comfortable that the way we were governing, the way we were thinking about that was really at the highest level possible. And we've continued to evolve that. Uh, and I think we're, we're moving ahead in really interesting ways. Recently, you have seen that we have two new members of our notre conseil, uh, le professor José O'Day, who was at the time, a recipient d'aide and a bourse of doctorate of the conseil. And uh, uh, John Baker, who you may have, uh, may have seen, is the, is the leader of, of one of the most exciting educational software companies in Canada, Desire, uh, Desire to Learn. And, and we're really proud of how that's going. I also want to say, in terms of our operating, this is the way the granting councils were, were born. You remember that Shirk and NSERC in 1977, MRC the, in, in the 1960s, and we kind of thought about ourselves that way. And we are now working in different ways. We're, we're imagining our, our work in different ways. And now with the arrival of CFI, and that kind of metaphor, whether it's T-shaped, whether it's overlapping Venn diagrams, and how you think about it, I think reflects some of the steps forward. We've also, sans doute, uh, vous avez bien remarqué, uh, with your collaboration, we've uh, uh, really rethought what we call our program architecture. 
Uh, and we've really put a focus on terms of the why. We've gone from talking about we give out fellowships and, and so on to talking about our contribution to developing talent. And we've started the conversations and so on along the lines that Graham was suggesting and to really think about that in new ways. Similarly, we've, we, we've said it is crazy, particularly us, to have something, a most difficult grant in Canada to get. What do we call it? What did we call it? Standard research grants. We can do better. What is that all about? Well, it's about uh, really uh, helping to gain insight about people in the past and present. That's what we're trying to do. And we rethought that. And, and I think uh, 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 it, it's a way of capturing uh, all of that. And then connection, we talked about that. And within that, again, opening the door to doing that with others. And in fact, we've always done that with others. There's no Shirk Research Grant that's paid 100% of anything because as you know, it always depends on institutions. It depends on many, many things, your time on and on. And, and we're acknowledging that and, and showing in fact that that door is open and we're welcoming that. Giselle, you have developed a, a wonderful phrase, the notion of really enabling creative open spaces and, and that 21st century uh, openness to, to research. And so far, I must say, uh, we've just been thrilled with, with how this has been rolling out. We had just a couple of weeks ago now, um, plus que 200 membres du de, de comité d'évaluation ici. On a eu la chance de jaser avec eux. We're going to continue working with you to make it better and better and better. Right now, we're struggling uh, in terms of our, our real effort to be at the frontier in terms of IT. Uh, the worst story in the history of academe, the common CV. We've now taken that over and uh, we're wrestling with it. We're going to get it better. I'm determined. I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, uh, and, and, and we're going to make it where, it where it needs to be and so on. I understand it's, 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 it's not good for any of us all the time, but on va l'avant. And I think, uh, I think we're committed to that continuous uh, improvement. Uh, come uh, Graham a indiqué, on a enveloppe uh, qui était protégée. Uh, you know, we continue, despite all kinds of, of challenges and so on, to be protected. We were pleased to see uh, our $7 million uh, uh, in reinvested uh, in us again, an opportunity to contribute in, in terms of uh, helping those who are handicapped in terms of the labor force participation and so on, M many sorts of, uh, of things, and again, that's a thrill uh, for us that, that in this environment, uh, we've been continued to, to uh, go ahead. Aussi, we, uh, on a lancé plusieurs initiatives, sans doute vous aurez remarqué que récemment, et en fait à l'actuel, il y a la, la possibilité de proposer uh, une synthèse des connaissances. Uh, Brent is our, is our leader on this, and, and it's, a, it's an initiative, uh, again, to try to help, to try to contribute to public debate along the lines of what Graham is, has been suggesting in terms of what happens to our, our graduates, what is the labor market like, how is that changing, and in a very different world. Who knows about these sorts of predictions, but there's no doubt that we can't think about those things in, in some of the ways that we have in the past. Another kind of point, I think, uh, is the notion that I don't think we're getting uh, arguments the way, uh, or the assumptions as the way we did in the past that behavior doesn't matter. Uh, you know, our notion, our focus on humans, on, on people, thought and behavior, people don't argue about that anymore. I think there's a new focus on it uh, in, in terms of, of our partnership and our collaboration with CIHR. Um, uh, there was work to do there. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but I think we're moving ahead. Uh, we've gotten Alain Baudet is, 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 I think, doing his best. There's a lot of history to overcome. Uh, but I think in terms of thinking about what we can do in our role, uh, Graham was alluding to this as well. The notion that our researchers get funding from CIHR, they get funding from CFI, they get funding from IDRC, they get funding from other bodies. It's not just us and our ability to collaborate in and make sure our, our scholars have access has really been at the heart of many of our uh, kinds of activities. I think it's also important, we've been trying to contribute as much as we can, like you have, to public debate. We've been doing this aggressively. Uh, Brent, for example, has a monthly online 
Globe and Mail column now. Uh, Giselle, you've seen her work and so on. Uh, Ted Hewitt, our new executive vice president, has is, is been actively contributed, and this is important. We're also looking for new creative ways of thinking about this. One of the most exciting initiatives that we've been uh, undertaking recently is our Storytellers Initiative. And, and Antonio, maybe you'll be able to uh, say a, a bit uh, uh, from your perspective uh, as, a, as one of our jury members on this. We've been just blown away. Is that right, Antonia? You've been pumped by... Unbelievable. I mean, it's just really exciting uh, uh, and, and creative, and, and it's the kind of thing that we're all over. Also today, uh, you'll have a chance to to uh, hear from my colleague Elliot Phillipson and, and his work at the Canadian Council of Academies. We were thrilled with, with uh, the fact that our recognition of the excellence, the quality of our fields uh, is now being highlighted in a, in a much greater extent. And I think there's much more, much more um, recognition, in fact, that how you measure, how you count uh, really is, is key. And, and our participation in that and, and under Elliot's leadership, I think we have a document that begins. It's, it's, a, it's a part of a journey. Mais en fait, uh, ça, ça nous montre la possibilité. So I just want to share with you a little bit why we might think, uh, and just to summarize quickly before we move on, I'll just give you seven reasons why I think, in fact, the value of our work I think we're, we're able to uh, articulate and, and have it accepted, and in fact is accepted across society to a much greater extent. First, the value proposition. I think there's clarity on our focus on people, and I think we're, we're starting to move away from some of the old metaphors and concepts and so on and, and false dichotomies, and I, think, and I think we're developing better vocabularies, better ways to talk about that. We've also embraced the uh, fact that, hey, listen, we are economically important. Uh, and I think we've been debunking some myths. We have a lot of work to do on that. Uh, we have some own work to do internally, as, as, as you know, but I think we're, 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 starting to, uh, we're, we're starting to get there. Or not. Uh, uh, I think also the notion of, of measurement evaluation, I think we paid a price for saying, oh, you know, our work is too complex, we can't measure, and so on, when in fact we spend our lives evaluating, we call it grading, but our whole profession uh, is based on evaluation. Like, it was pretty silly to say, oh, we can't do that to ourselves. In fact, we can. There's a lot of work to do on this, uh, uh, and redefining excellence as a social construction, on and on, but we're doing better. We're also connecting now with some of the most exciting areas, as was alluded to, medical humanities, Genomics, I had a chance to talk about on and on. Engaged scholarship as well. We're, we're embracing the fact that every sector is looking to us for help, whether it's the private sector, public sector, not. They're looking to us, help us, help us. And, and I think we realize that we can make a difference and there is a, a big interest in trying to create a better world based on understandings of, of people, of, of human thought uh, and behavior. Hello. Or not? Are we frozen? Voila. Okay. Uh, the leading edge, uh, as was alluded to, uh, the. <laughs> we don't control that part. If we had better engineers in here, we'd uh, we'd do much better. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but but uh, uh, you know, in terms of our initiatives and so on. Uh, I, I think that's been really, really key. And I think in terms of renewing, reinventing our undergraduate and graduate programs, re rethinking that, one of my arguments has been that the way in which we have taught uh, historically has been much more on the side of learning than many other fields, whether it's the fact in literature we read, uh, we asked our students to interpret and challenge and so on. There are traditions that are very important there, but there are other aspects that we can move as well. Uh, so let's dive, uh, dive into this notion, well, how do you, how do you, uh, if you want to create a better future, how do you embrace Northrop Fry's challenge? Qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec ça? And I think it's been interesting that there been, over the years, there have been a number of studies that have been done on our programming at Shirk, and they've, in fact, said, uh, you know what, uh, uh, Shirk can do a, a, a better job on this uh, uh, in terms of how they think about uh, some of this. And uh, this is a study done by Nicole Beja-Haik and Marie Brochu in, in 2008. 
And they pointed out one of the problems in terms of focusing on problems or issues now that you so end up pr uh, producing solutions for, for old problems. Uh, in fact, th there, uh, Shirk does have a, a history uh, that I think is sometimes forgotten that's important. For example, right after we were created, we ended up fo focusing on aging. And at that time, there wasn't a, a big uh, focus in terms of popular opinion. The baby boom was, uh, was young. Uh, and people weren't worrying about it. But in fact, it, it had a huge impact, and our research was able to make enormous contributions in terms of elder care, in terms of pension plans, compulsory retirement, on and on. And as a result of this investment, Canada aged as a society much more successfully than uh, some of the predictions had been at the time, and in fact, something that, that we often embrace. Similarly, uh, just au, au début du uh, uh, 21e siècle, uh, we launched a, a future uh, uh, attempt, a, a, a foresight effort, Alternative Worlds, the Humanities in 2010. Uh, and, and, and I think this uh, played a key role in our work. One of the things they emphasized was the notion, in fact, that the, uh, the digital world was really key for us. And, and it talked about the exciting opportunities to become partners and innovators. And it was gracias a that we launched the Image Tech Sound and Technology Initiative that uh, a number of you in this room have, have been pioneers in. And I think it's fair to say, and, and, and Elliot maybe can talk about this later, Canada leads the world in digital humanities. Uh, and in fact, uh, that was even confirmed in a report that uh, we weren't too pleased with uh, some years ago. Uh, and it was certainly reaffirmed again. And in digging into data, we see how well Canadians do in that international collaboration. And it's now having a huge impact. So in terms of, our, in ter in terms of that kind of contribution, that investment, again, uh, uh, out in front, I think helped uh, uh, really foster the notion that the digital age is not just about the digital uh, technologies. We're not in a technologically driven age. Instead, that's part of a, a complex mix in which the question of content, uh, and I mean that in a very robust way, and then, the, and then how that's being used and where it's being used uh, is key, a uh, notion of digital literacy. And that's what's framing our, our era. And in fact, when you think about it, Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it's an equilateral triangle, I think we now understand. But in fact, the, this side of it, the technology side, is often the one that's uh, uh, thought about and, and I think far out ahead. And I think our mission in life is to show, in fact, technologies are instead enabling and accelerating and then influencing deep conceptual changes that are, in fact, all uh, uh, people-centered. I think Steve Jobs got this, uh, one of his quotes that you see all the time, and I think it's really, really important that that connection is now being recognized everywhere, and, and I think Canada was at the heart of that. There have also been some stunning insights that you may see. The New York Times, uh, best, uh, uh, their annual year in ideas, uh, one of the best was, in fact, a work of a, a literature prof, uh, uh, Ian Lancashire at U of T teamed up with a colleague in computer science, and they were able to show by studying the digital corpus of Ang Ag Agatha Christie's novels uh, uh, the onset of dementia. Uh, and I think uh, that was an issue that had arisen in a number of contexts in the medical community and so on. They knew at the end of her life she suffered from Alzheimer's. When did that, how did that unfold? How do you tell that? And they were able to show through a systematic textual analysis in terms of word choice, sentence structure, on and on, uh, and trace that in unprecedented ways. It's also led to interesting therapies and so on, diagnostic tools. I don't let people read my email and batch anymore, but, but I think, uh, and you should probably shouldn't either, but anyway, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's just one example of the kinds of insights. It's also interesting, you know, we a lot of uh, debate about MOOCs and so on. That terminology comes from Canadians, you may know. This was from that knowledge synthesis that, that George Siemens, uh, 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 Dave Cormier did at the time, and they were the ones that really got hold of this some years ago internationally recognized, uh, uh, and, and I think uh, in all kinds of, of different areas and, and really, really exciting to us. So when you think about that, uh, one of the good things is that our identification and, uh, of some of these issues have, in fact, led to uh, uh, some of those uh, investments over the years, whether it's in terms of our initiative on the new economy when we started that, in terms of, of digital media, in terms of environment, the North. We, we, we are still, uh, in terms of Aboriginal research, which we 
had a great session uh, at CERC this week, thinking about uh, steps forward. This is still uh, something that we've been focusing on without uh, formal uh, additional extra money on that. It's going to remain a priority for us uh, as part of this. So the, the question uh, that, that comes back, though, okay, if you want to make a better future, if you want to think about that, how do you pick the issues? That's the question. And this is something that came out of the report that was done uh, just as I was getting uh, into the position with Jim Miller, who looked at, uh, uh, Jim Mitchell, who looked at uh, our, our programs and, and did that study. And, and we've embarked on this and, and really uh, uh, thought about that. Uh, et, et je pense que la, la, le, le défi, évidemment, dans tout ça, est de, OK, si on va créer, imaginer l'avenir, qu'est-ce qu'on fait et comment on fait ça? Obviously, at the start, we have to emphasize that one thing about the future is that it can be really surprising. Um, this is a famous photo. Uh, these are students, engineering students, just arriving at the University of Ottawa. They were real happy there. They thought, <clears throat> they thought it was all good. And anyway, um, uh, so uh, my historian side says, wait a minute here. You know, when we think about the future, the history of this is not good. There's a famous study, Histoire de l'Avenir, basically shows predictions don't work out well and so on. So how do we really embrace this? Uh, how do we think about that? So uh, le Conseil a prouvé uh, en, en, au, au printemps uh, 2011 l'idée en fait de, de, de déterminer les défis futurs pour le Canada dans un contexte mondialisé en évolution lesquels risquent de, de souvenir uh, 5 ans, 10 ans, 20 ans and where we could contribute. And I think that was our mission, uh, our approach. What do we do? Well, we started out with the fact that this exercise is a field in the social science humanities. So we, we went and we found those who were really focused on this. Giselle and the team met uh, and, and really kind of thought that through. And we took a real engagement approach. Uh, we used our Shirk Leaders Network, which is terrific and has really been complementing the Federation in terms of uh, on campuses or, uh, across Canada. <clears throat> we engaged across the sectors. We even reached out to our partners uh, from the start. And it's great to see partners here. I see Kelly, CHR and others. Uh, just terrific. They actively participated in this. And as you know, the Federation played a huge role. Uh, uh, Jean-Marc Margin was with us, uh, Graham and others. Uh, Noreen Goffman uh, helped us all along the way. And many, many of you, uh, round tables across the country, uh, just a real, uh, really exciting kinds of thing. Multiple lines of evidence from abroad. We looked at international context. And we also looked with others we're doing, whether it's here in Canada, internationally, uh, and so on. And we also thought about that in terms of uh, different groups. We engaged uh, youth. Uh, you may have seen we were on Twitter about this all the time. We were really reaching out. There was a survey on and on, and that's been really, really exciting. Uh, and I think uh, that engagement, PR, there was Jean-Marc, uh, uh, and we see some leaders uh, uh, speaking with Roseanne Runte, who was a, a guest uh, at that particular meeting. Anyway, and we were able to really focus and, and move ahead. Uh, a complicated approach that had stages and so on, it really uh, had this build uh, o over time and, and so on, and, and is leading to uh, a period now where we're really reflecting and, and we're going to be able to think about that. Some of the considerations that emerged on and on, no, we're not predicting the future. Instead, we're imagining Canada's future. Uh, and we're trying to do that, obviously, in a context. We, we can't, we're not starting at zero, but, but we're really trying to imagine that. How to articulate that? You know, when you, when you focus on something, do you, do you use questions, do you, a sub issue? How do you do all that? And you can see, you can see uh, where, we, where we are at this point. And there was, it's interesting, cross-cutting or separate, something that we all, the vertical horizontal choice that we all make uh, about our issues, for example, can we think about what's happening in, the, in digital scholarship now? Does that cut across everything, or should we hive that off, put it separately? Similarly, when you think about Aboriginal peoples, well, in terms of urban, north, on and on, does that cut across, or is that something that needs a focus uh, uh, by itself? So how do we think about that? But one decision we did make, though, is that we're, whatever it is, whatever we decide to do, we're going to integrate it into our structure. We're not going to have new programs and so on. We're going to make it part and parcel of, of, of what we do. Alors, je vais uh, lire ra rapidement où nous sommes à l'actuel. C'est toujours une ébauche de ça. Tu vois que nous sommes uh, uh, décidés qu'on fait pour la, la, 
le moment au moins, il y a le, le format de poser des questions. And one of the things that came up a lot over and over again, and this was alluded to, how our world of education is, is transforming. And I would argue based on deep conceptual changes, moving from teaching to learning on and on in terms of how we think about advancing knowledge and understanding on our campuses, clearly the, uh, something that, that we need to continue focus on. We need to reinvent uh, institutions. You may, you know, as we all know, you know, 200 years, basically, we've been building mass school systems that we were, basi were based w without ever posing the question, how do people learn? It's kind of, it's like, and now that we've actually started to focus on that and in recent decades, it's like, whoops. So the best idea is not to put kids in little rows and the best idea is not to have everyone sit there passively taking notes and so on. There are much better ways to do this. Let's rethink this. And I know there's specialists in the room uh, who focus on this a lot. We are really reimagining uh, education in, in important ways at all levels, and that's exciting. Obviously, the question of the sustainable uh, communities in terms of resources and so on, that's obviously a, a big focus. Issues around social cohesion, citizen engagement, democratic renewal. Uh, uh, came up as a focus all the time. Clearly different ways of knowing uh, the, in, in the Canadian context in, in terms of First Nations, Inuit, Métis, uh, how, how, does that, how does that come together? How that richness, how can we make that work? New notions of local, the, the, the ways in which local context matters at the same way it's connected to, to global phenomena. How, do, how does that way work in a multipolar uh, world? Comment peut-on jeter un regard nouveau sur les défis locaux, nationaux et mondiaux au XXIe siècle, à, à l'aide de la dynamique des populations, des phases de transition de la vie, the whole notion of life course changing so much now, and, and what does that mean in terms of new ways of thinking, thinking about that? Toute la, la question de la complexité des systèmes économiques. Uh, we talk about global economies and, new, and new, new ways in which geopolitical boundaries are playing differently. How, how, do, we manage, how do we manage all that? Obviously, the, 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 the question of the technology emergent to the intellectual, social, and cultural. How do we think about that? How do we uh, favor innovation and really influence Canadian society in terms of our creative side, in terms of research and the arts, in terms of the cultural industries. How does that all work? And finally, the whole question of the risks in society, the security of the 21st century. How do we deal with the shocks, the, 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 the questions of resilience and so on, uncertainty? How do we live in, in that, kind of, at that kind of world? So going forward, how do we think about that? Our focus has to be on our special contribution in terms of what can SHRC do that's really necessary, that's not happening already? How can we make, uh, 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 make a difference in terms of promoting and nurturing something? How can, how can, what do we have to do? We can't build any more programs. We have, we have done our best to, to lower the burden in terms of grantsmanship, all that sort of stuff. We don't want to go there, but we, uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to start complexifying all that again. We just simplified it. We also want to imagine a menu of possibilities, a policy, program, and engagement activities, a, a diverse way of thinking about that, depending on, on, on how we're trying to contribute. And obviously, we're going to keep engaging. This is not over. We're going to keep engaging. We're going to think this through with you uh, over the coming uh, months, and I think it's an exciting opportunity. I want to invite you all, uh, 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 there's the Congress uh, coming up this spring and we're all going to be there. It's exciting and we hope that that feeds into uh, a, a worldwide event that's coming to Montreal, Myaktub, uh, Alotan, and I invite you all to come to that. It's organized by the International Social Science Council and we're redefining that now uh, in terms of really the social science and humanities. As, uh, as you know, uh, the International Association for the Humanities let me just say it frankly, is not working well, uh, has not been working well, uh, and, and I think we're going to try to help change that. Uh, but for the moment, we're opening that tent, and this is really about people, human thought and behavior in the past and present, and the focus is on the transformations in the digital age. Wonderful opportunity for Canada to, to really 
uh, contribute to an international debate. 58 countries have already confirmed, and I hope to see you all there. I also want to tell you, in terms of moving forward, we're partners and, in fact, the leaders for the Americas, Canada, U.S., Brazil, and Argentina, in a proposal to the European Commission to build a transatlantic platform for the social science humanities. And I think that's an exciting, uh, exciting initiative, and I hope we'll be able to launch that next fall. Je vais terminer juste pour dire, can we really be optimistic? Should we be optimistic? And I want to remind us that it was really just a little over a century ago that, you know, Einstein sitting there, paper and pencil, uh, having some deep thoughts. Well, uh, during the century, we as humans decided to get serious about that and uh, invested hugely to try to pursue some of his ideas, among others, right? Similarly, I think you could say, you know, for some time now, people, novelists, uh, uh, all sorts of people, uh, some efforts saying, you know, space, uh, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to check that out. Well, we got serious about that. There's a long way to go, but uh, made some huge progress. The, by the way, the Time magazine was 1952. Got, got, got serious about that uh, and made some, made some huge progress. Can we get serious about, as a society, about humans, about understanding people and understand that that's how society must be focused, must be centered? Uh, can, we, can we embrace that challenge? I think we are embracing it. And my sense is, à la fin, pourquoi Nous sommes toujours vivants, il y a toujours un intérêt, et d'après moi, on verra de plus en plus euh, le besoin, l'importance de ce qu'on fait, la contribution qu'on peut faire. Uh, we have to, some work to do to get, get to, that, to that challenge. I don't know if the 21st century is going to be called the human century, the century when we took people seriously, but I hope all of us, and I know your work and others, my sense is that when our descendants look back on us, and they say, you know, did they do all they could to make this century go better, to make a better world? I hope that they're going to be looked back on us and say, you know what? They did all they could to help us uh, get there. Uh, our new strategic plan, take a picture, download it. A grand merci à tous et toutes. Thank you. Some questions. I okay. Want to sit or stand? Here. Uh, here, let's sit for a minute. Well, thanks, Chad. As usual, uh, inspiring, full of ideas, and full of uh, confidence about uh, about where we're going in the future or can go in the future. We've got about uh, 20 minutes or so to. Uh, is this, uh, that's that. Those those engineers. Again. <coughs> thanks. We got we're we're going to help them innovate. <laughs> We got about 20 minutes or so for uh, questions and comments. Uh, alors, si vous voulez uh, poser des questions, il y a des, uh, des micros installés à chaque uh, côté de la salle. Uh, please use them and uh, identify yourselves. You're not a shy crowd. Let's get started here. Thank you, sir. Maybe you are a shy crowd. <laughs> God. <laughs> Someone? All right. Yeah. You want to use the microphone just so, because we're, we're also recording this, so. Hi, I'm uh, Karen Stanbridge from uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, very inspirational and uh, given me a lot to think about. I really like the focus on people. I mean, it's, and that's something that we've always done and we've always recognized that we have done but at the same time, I think that that focus is what has gotten us where we are now, which is in a disadvantaged position. Um, when we see uh, overwhelmingly in Europe and here uh, programs introduced by governments um, introducing austerity packages in order to you know, uh, make sure that the god of the economy is running properly, that uh, people are continually being used and uh, subject to decisions by our power makers as being the ones who have to have to sort of take the burden on behalf of the market in order to 
to uh, make sure that, that presumably the economy, which is for people, is running properly. How do we begin to, how, how do we begin, <laughs> us humble humanities and social science folks, to begin to uh, and, and continue to counter that? I mean, we've got people on the streets in Greece. We've got people on the streets in uh, Quebec, students on the street. We've got people in the streets. How do we contribute to those efforts uh, as academics in order to forward that focus on people that have, has begun from the ground? Uh, I think we have, we do have that opportunity to contribute and to link up with that, that real feeling that people are being forgotten. How do we begin? Thanks. A, a really good question, and um, obviously there are no easy answers, but I think the, the part of it that maybe there's room for optimism is in fact among the leaders of uh, some successful companies. And what, what's being challenged is the notion that there's, there's economic growth, and that has to come at the expense of people. And increasingly, there's the notion that instead, the way to grow the economy is to embrace the importance of quality of life. So, for example, uh, some of the research we've been funding that I'm very uh, excited about uh, is, is in linking questions of the economy to environmental issues. And there's a really interesting thrust now around how building sustainable companies is how you do the best. Uh, and, and it's, uh, uh, you know, some examples that jumped, uh, jumped to my mind just uh, a couple weeks ago, Tima Banso uh, at Western was uh, the featured speaker at the launch of the Canada Research Chairs, the, the latest, uh, uh, latest announcement. And her network that she've established has, for example, uh, convinced uh, the TD Bank to go carbon neutral. Uh, and companies are increasingly understanding that if their footprint is not where it needs to be in terms of uh, 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 they, they will not succeed as a company. I think what's going on, and you can think about many jurisdictions now, that um, uh, environmental issues now are becoming part of the calculus in terms of consumers and so on. And, and uh, that, that dichotomy, that tension is in fact uh, going away. Similarly, in terms of companies, uh, now, in terms of the search for talent and so on, thinking about thinking about human resources in different ways uh, and understanding that if we see one as in competition with the other, uh, similarly, uh, that's not that's not going to be good for business. So, uh, and I think you extend that the focus now on you know the Gini uh, coefficients in terms of social inequality notions that for a society to be successful, you cannot have increasing social inequality. It's, everyone has to worry about those Gini coefficients. And I use the example historically of the rise of Canada during the 20th century. You know, at the start of the 20th century, uh, sure, you know, Laurier says, you know, Canada's uh, 20, 20th century is going to belong to Canada, blah, blah, blah. But there wasn't anybody who really thought Canada was going to emerge as one of the world's most successful societies in the 20th century. And, and when you think about that, you know, early 20th century, Argentina, economically uh, booming, resources like crazy. Uh, I think they had the fourth largest uh, uh, GDP and so on. So, but what happened? Because they, 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 they didn't link uh, the notion of having a, a quality of life successful society was a, was a civil, strong civil society and so on was really at the heart of their ability to sustain that. So I think, I think my sense at least, I think there's a compelling argument to make that thinking in terms of uh, a, a society is the key to having a good economy, to having a good business. 
And I think that um, I, I think that those interconnectedness, that's where the argument is. And I think that you look at uh, uh, David, where did I see David? Well, somewhere, there, there is the back. His research shows, for example, in terms of what he calls clusters. You know, companies want to, want to, want to uh, establish themselves in areas that have good schools, that have good quality of life, the, the, uh, and on and on. So there's an interrelationship argument there that I think is, is where uh, there's hope for, for this. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that, obviously, it's a long way to go. It's flying in the face of, you know, centuries in which we really focus on the fact that, yeah, there are going to be haves and have-nots. I want to be part of the haves, and that's going to, my success is, is going to have to come at the expense of those, and on and on. Different paradigm, different way of thinking. But I think those deep conceptual changes, I think, are emerging, and I think they're emerging quickly. Okay, and other, other questions? John Williams, uh, adjunct professor at uh, Carleton and Ottawa U, former member of the board. Uh, when you were talking about Shirk's uh, current focus, I had a feeling of deja vu because of the um, program that Shirk instituted back in the 1980s, the Human Context of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the current thrust uh, recapitulates a number of the objectives of that particular program. But my question is, has Shirk uh, done evaluations of previous programs that are maybe somewhat similar to what you want to do now to see what lessons can be learned from the past? Indeed, uh, 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 we do evaluations a lot, uh, in, including all those programs, and Giselle and, and her team have gone through them all systematically. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the outcomes of that I alluded to a bit uh, in terms of my example of aging was the fact that we have not told the story often about the importance of some of these. You know, uh, when you think back, some of the things we focused on in terms of women in change, you, you mentioned uh, technology, you know, on and on, uh, our research was at the heart of uh, new ways of thinking about, in our larger society, uh, key issues that, 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 that became uh, a key and had, had a huge impact uh, later on. So I think our first point we realized uh, and, and developed a lot of pride in the fact that, wow, early on was in, onto these, made contributions. My, my sense a little bit is uh, we didn't at the time, we were a little internally focused about that. And I think now we're trying to do it in, 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 the, in terms of those ambitions of quality connection impact. We're trying to link it to the notion that if we really want to go ahead, if we, you know, excellence, we really want to do better, we've got to benefit from this. We also have to do it in a connected way. A lot of the topics that, that we were working on were intimately connected to the other granting councils, for example. They were connected to other sorts of things. And I'm not saying we were a silo, but, but we, we thought about that among ourselves. We weren't connected. And we certainly, in terms of impact, we certainly didn't uh, tell that story and really unpack that in ways other than, as your question is alluding to, that our internal evaluations, uh, and, and often they sat on a shelf. So I think uh, your point is, is, is true, and, and we're going to try to do a lot better this time. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Leif Warga. I teach at uh, Northrop Frye's University, Victoria <laughs> University. And um, in imagining Canada's future, of course, one is uh, with Northrop Frye working on uh, the uh, imaginary that uh, will shape uh, whatever uh, we decide to do. Uh, Northrop Frye, um, while he talked about the uh, role of the imagination, assumed um, the role of memory. And mm. it's not clear to me in what you sketch as under the aegis of innovation and uh, the digital triangle and whatnot, how especially in the humanities, Shirk would uh, be working on that part 
uh, of the problem. Namely, uh, if one thinks of the humanities as cultivating the sort of uh, memory necessary not to keep repeating the same problems, um, it, it, uh, those other kinds of knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, seem to me to, uh, for example, be one of the places one might tap into that. But I don't hear in what was said today a very clear uh, program for supporting the work of memory as one of the kinds of knowledge uh, the humanities in special uh, would uh, contribute to that larger political problem. I'd just like to hear a little bit more on that. Sure, and, and let, me, uh, um, let me say what I say often, and if you've read recently the cover story on university affairs, this was their focus. I think that the, the leading edge of all, everything I just said is the field now titled Digital Humanities. Why? Because I think what scholars are showing us is that in terms of uh, what Ray Siemens, who's in our room here, calls the, the new knowledge environments uh, that we're coming to grips with, that the, the the talent, the scholarship of whether we talk about historians through, through literature scholars on and on, that we understand now that um, at the heart of what is often thought about as a technological phenomenon is in fact um, the traditional classic uh, approaches of the humanities. And, and whether you talk about uh, analyzing text, whether you talk about analyzing images and sounds and, and trying to interpret, give meaning to all that, it seems to me that, that uh, humanity scholars are absolutely driving uh, that agenda. So um, I'm not sure where I failed in, in my presentation this morning, but uh, I know in my fields as an historian, for example, when we think about you know, everybody from John Bonnet, Kevin Key, obviously, Ray, uh, across the country, uh, uh, I, I saw Susan, on and on, I think uh, humanity scholars are setting the agenda in Canada and internationally and are, in fact, at the heart of what we're talking about the new, the new, the deep conceptual changes that I talk about in terms of complexity, diversity, and creativity are all uh, straight out of and in, in, in the, in the, at the heart of the humanities. So uh, that's certainly clear to us, and, and I'll, uh, well, maybe we can talk about this, but I thought I'm certainly doing my best to articulate this, and if you, if you read the cover story in University Affairs, I think it'll unpack it some more. Yes. Yes, Chad, I totally agree with you. My question has to do with... Suzanne, oh, I'm sorry. not everyone in the room knows oh, I'm who sorry. you are. I'm Suzanne Crosta from McMaster University. And my question has to do with connections and fostering interdisciplinary research. And all of us here, I think, are, are totally committed to, that, to those connections. But there are... Um, uh, challenges and barriers for those collaborations to take place. I know that the granting councils have done their very best to try to to start that collaboration. And I'm, and I'm wondering whether or not you can talk a little bit more about how you're trying to, uh, how together you're trying to, you know, uh, support the researchers who are taking risks right because there's there are disciplinary pressures sometimes right in trying to have that research recognized or to have or to reconfiguring a department in order to make in order to foster that and this is the route we have to take and i know that as as an academic leaders and many of us are here when we try to do this in our institutions it is extremely difficult if we can start at the researchers, you know what I mean, the granting councils, fostering and, 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 uh, and different kinds of approaches that we can, you know, that our researchers can take, and then bring it to our institutions to try to make that happen, I think it could be very, very promising for us. And let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about. 
I know that at one point our Department of Linguistics was having a lot of difficulty in trying to survive within the economic models and also within the kinds of pressures. People didn't see, the, you know, what are you going to do with a linguistics degree? Well, no matter how many times we sang the song, it wasn't, get, it wasn't, it wasn't as powerful as when I hired a neuroscientist to, <laughs> to lead the department and make the case and get the whole department revitalized. And yesterday, we saw on, on, on national TV, 16 by 9, the neuroscientist was from the Department of Linguistics in Humanities, right? This is what we can do. And it goes back to your point about us being leaders in our field, right? And then, bringing, and then just kind of changing the mindset. Yes, we can hire a neuroscientist in the Department of Linguistics. And yes, it's going to bring us in a different direction and a really exciting one for all of us. And I can't tell you, I mean, that's, my, that's one of my strongest departments. I can go on and on like that, but it's really challenging, I find, because we have to kind of uh, convince our own peers that, you know, there's a lot of possibilities here. And let me tell you what it can look like, but in the beginning, you're fighting the fight just to get it off the ground. So if our, re if, our if our granting councils can show that you know we are going to be supporting this type of research, we're also going to be supporting how it you know how it can you know uh, it be implemented in our institutions and in our scholarly associations, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Terrific question. So three quick comments. First one is um, I think what we're witnessing is uh, you know a truly deep Kuhnian paradigm shift in terms of how do we think about advancing knowledge and understanding? So I would argue that for certainly since the Enlightenment uh, scientific revolution, the idea was you advance knowledge and understanding by focus, by specialization. In the metaphor that I like to use is of a jigsaw puzzle. We, we imagine everything we want to understand is a big jigsaw puzzle, and then we agree, I'll take this piece and study it in increasing intensity. You take that one and so on. And we built our, built our whole school system around that, right? The whole thing was like a pyramid down to a uh, real specialization at the top. So that, and that was how we were going to advance knowledge and build understanding. And let's face it, you know, as an historian, I'm always reluctant to say, talk about progress. But when you ever ask an historian, when do you want to live? They, they don't say, well, actually, a, a century ago. Generally speaking, we say, yeah, okay, I'll live now. So, so, so it did certain things, and, but I think we realize now that it got us basically as far as it's going to get us. And in fact, that, the metaphor of the jigsaw puzzle and specialization is, is not good. Why? Because, to stay with that for a minute, I can put my piece back in and it changes the whole puzzle. And I know in art disciplines and history, for example, you know, in the 1960s, all of a sudden, there was lots of focus in terms of the history of women, for example. That piece started to get put in the puzzle, and the whole puzzle started to change, right? And, and it went on. You can think of many examples. So, so uh, across fields, on and on. So I think now, and that's where the T-shape. I think now we understand, yes, we need specialization, but we have to think about that in a connected way. Um, and, and I think that, how do we do that? How do we get away from that additive and instead an interactive, nonlinear way of thinking about how we advance knowledge and build understanding. My second point is we did a survey in 2008, part of the Blue Ribbon Panel. We wanted to uh, think about this. And one of the questions that was asked, and maybe some of you remember answering, because we got very robust answers. One thing we have at Shirk is a lot of emails, uh, 22,000 email addresses. We sent it out. We have had well over 6,000 responses. So, and then we analyzed the data, very robust, very robust data. One, the best question was, my humble opinion, very interesting. We asked researchers to self-identify. How do you think about your scholarship? And there were four choices given. On one side was exclusively disciplinary, and on the other side was extremely interdisciplinary. And then, and, and now obviously we can cut that humanities, we can pull out social sciences. I always like to focus on history. But you know, you can think about you can think about newer scholars, more established scholars, you can do it any way you want. How did that work out? And just think in your mind quickly, if you haven't seen me show the slide, because I I just love it because it was so interesting. Exclusively disciplinary. And now this is an anonymous survey, people don't have to answer, and so on. Think about how that got responded to. And think about over here, extremely interdisciplinary. Across fields. 
social sciences and humanities across uh, generations to a lesser extent, but the predominant response of us was around 5% self-defined now is exclusively disciplinary. Really interesting. 25% self-defined as extremely interdisciplinary. The same pattern for humanities, again, self-defined, self humanities scholars and social sciences. So clearly there's something going on now that's really interesting uh, and, and we're trying to come to grips with. We've been working in terms of that T-shaped. Uh, can we open those doors? I was thrilled to some steps ahead. Some of you may have noticed that NSERC joined our Digging Into Data initiative. So, so there's some examples. We've got a long way to go. Uh, I see Kelly here, the, the, the Governing Council of CHR invited me to talk with them. Maybe, maybe later on you have a chance to chat about that. I was just at Genome Canada uh, for, uh, for uh, an hour with their, with their board and so on. There's interest in us. Uh, and I know many of you, and just along the lines of you're saying, right? So the question becomes, how do we build T-shaped structures? The good news is that, and we've changed in terms of our criteria, uh, the way we organize many things, giving people opportunities for interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary ev evaluation, on, on, cross-sectoral. We have found that getting the shirt grant is a kind of stamp of approval. And I pose this question, tell me if I'm wrong. I am unaware of any scholar who has gotten a SHRC grant who has had tenure promotion issues. So maybe we have a little lever here and that by, by making sure that we're enabling the kinds of scholarship that's, that, that people want to do now, that maybe that's going to help in context in which uh, some traditional structures and whatever are still alive and kicking. We all have to work on this. It's a deep, deep change, but I think we can be optimistic. Okay, we've got time for one more question and at least to discover if that microphone's working. Okay. Hello. My name is Kelly Torrance, and um, I'm, uh, I'm here as a, a, a quote-unquote observer, as it was outlined on your agenda. Um, my background is in education, and I work in uh, the medical field. I work for the College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Royal College of Canada. And I just wanted to reach out, if that's okay with you, uh, just to point out so many of the issues that you've raised today um, are being experienced in almost every field on your university campus. And I, my, my, my other hat is a business management hat. And that realistically, I think what we need to be asking ourselves is how are we going to build the competency for collaboration into our people? And I mean, we struggle with this in, in every area. Uh, you know, we're not, and y'all aren't alone. I'm part of you, you're part of me. Um, how do we not only um, avoid this, the wisdom happening too late, how do we build that competency into our kids, you know, as they grow as students, as into, uh, into these Venn diagrams so that when you see yourself in, a, in the small parts of a Venn diagram that you actually see yourself as leading from behind, that you see yourself, the value that you bring to that conversation, and that the power of a dialogue, having a decaf with someone else, is really what moves things forward. And so what I really wanted to do is just sort of stand up and, and say I heard a few other things today that, do, that in language speak to attitudes and realistically the biggest barrier, no matter what, I have, I've been a part of leadership teams, you know, enabling change all over the place and we all know it, the biggest barriers that we have are the attitudes that we bring. And that in your dialogue today, to really focus on what those are, what those historical things are, and just um, and also what I found as well that can be really helpful is the power of analogy. Try to bring analogy to your tables today. You're going to be using jargon. You're going to you know you have a code. Everybody's got their thing, but the power of analogy can often push those small lines in the Venn diagram a lot farther out because we're speaking the same language. I'd rather talk to you about making a cake, and making a cake to me means something, you know, whatever it means, and your cake might be different, but we're all making a cake, 
right? And, and I understand how to make a cake. So just think about, think about your language, think about how you can build these competencies into the people that you teach, into the structures that you inform. Um, and in addition to that, we, someone mentioned memory, and that's so interesting, and I find it very interesting as well that you, you've pointed out that storytelling and I'm looking forward to hearing about this initiative, but storytelling has been a weakness so far, that, that telling your story, sort of branding you know, your, your value and your importance hasn't necessarily been done as well as it could have been. And the importance of memory and the importance of understanding data and keeping it and making sure it's accessible that people understand value. It's interesting using that, that, uh, the dementia example that, that you know, this weakness of memory um, think about what, what a weakness of memory does and think about that in, often what happens when we become very anxious is memory is the first thing to go, isn't it? And if we think about that wider picture of this big brain that we are, that we are actually now realizing here at this point in time that we're a neuroplastic brain. We're this wonderful thing where we can build these new neural networks together. And where we might have had this weakness, we can actually build a whole new thing that will do what it used to do and actually might do something better. So when, if you think of yourself as being this incredibly valuable memory that, and that you are so important in this interconnected brain, that realistically what we might point to as being weaknesses, in fact, are huge opportunities for articulated strength. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. A couple more reasons for optimism. I think and maybe today you can share amongst yourselves. I think there are some great initiatives in terms of those new competencies. Can I give a shout out to Concordia and the program Absolutely. you developed in terms of the grad pro skills and so on, trying to enrich that whole experience. I think it's terrific and many of you have examples about that. I totally agree. We need better metaphors, new metaphors. We need to capture better. I mean, we're, we're all those false dichotomies that, that we've been uh, inheriting from from uh, past decades need to be jettisoned. We 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 and we can contribute on that score. I think we're we're uh, we're supposed to own words. We're supposed to earn own images and metaphors and 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 I think we can really contribute uh, 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 in in the ways you're you're uh, you're you're suggesting. And just to close, I want to thank all those that just came this morning, uh, made special efforts, uh, invited. Uh, uh, just a thrill to see you all here. Grand merci à tous et tous. Avant de vous me uh, demander de, de, de remercier à Chad, I just want to take a moment to remind you we have a break now till 10.30, and then there are four breakout sessions, one on, uh, all taking place in uh, Salon Cartier and the Salon Albert uh, on this floor. One is on the end of membership. One is on effective use of social media. One is on communicating the value of uh, social science and humanities research, and one is on CIHR renewal. So all of those begin at 10.30. But now, please join me in thanking Chad for an absolutely wonderful presentation Thank and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, man. That was terrific. And I just want to offer you a